we're discussing something very important because there's something happening right now in the world where people are questioning, asking, making documentaries about who are the Jews, the authenticity of the Jewish people, and therefore it's very important that we respond to these comments about who the Jewish people are and what we represent, Shalom Chevra, because there's a lot of questions that are now going around. Maybe these are not the real Jews, maybe these other people are Jews, and therefore we have to respond to that. And it's very important to have clarity that people should know. So we begin like this. When Adam was in the garden, Adam and Eve, so Adam received a great light. Hashem blew into the nostrils of Adam, the Yipach, the app of Nishmas Chayim. He blew in a very, very special light, very, very powerful light. And it would have been such a thing that the entire world would have been filled with this light. All of humanity would have been filled with this light. Anybody wants more information on the subject, they have to learn Derech Hashem, the way of God, by Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato. And that light would have gone forth for all the children of Adam. What happened though, Adam decided to eat from the fruit, he listened to the snake, and it became a very confusing situation. Adam became very confused. He became filled with doubt, with safek, and his physicality and his spirituality were confused. Now he was much, much greater, but he put already into humanity this confusion. And very sadly, there was 10 generations from Adam, and the world started spinning more out of control. And the Rambam describes that the beginning of the laws of idol worship, everybody has to learn this. And especially, why am I making mention of this with all the sources? Because sadly, there's been people that have been mentioning things about the Torah, about Hashem's Torah, and we have to defend the Torah, because they're taking things out of context and they're taking little bits and pieces. You know, when you start to do your research and you just Google stuff and then piece stuff together, whatever you want, you can make up any story that you want. And therefore, anybody who really wants and is trying to say things about the Talmud, first come and learn some Talmud. Anybody here been here a few years? Is the Talmud something easy that you could just open up and quote random things from? Or you realize this stuff is... This is deep. This is complex. This is, this is real stuff. And by the way, anybody who thinks that there's only a written Torah, but not an oral Torah, so we know that that cannot be, because everywhere in the written Torah, there are gaps which leave space for the oral tradition. For example, in the written Torah it says, And you shall do ritual slaughter, as I have shown you. Okay, you're waiting for the written Torah to mention, you know, okay, you showed me how to do this ritual slaughter. I want to eat some Kobe beef. I, I don't know how to do it. it you didn't, where's, where do you, what's the answer? As I've shown you is the oral tradition. The oral tradition and the written tradition are one thing. So somebody wants to quote online something from the Talmud. You have to learn the Talmud properly. Come. And see then, see the context of everything. So back to us. We're tracing the lineage after Adam. And what happens at that time? The world is spinning out of control. The Rambam explains how in the times of Enosh, there were already great mistakes happening in the world. The main mistake was, you want to hear what old school, the OG idol worshippers were doing? You ready? They had an interesting sfarah. Their thought, was the, their thought process was the following. They said, well, you know, when you have a king, they knew about God, obviously, and there was only one. They said, well, doesn't a king also want that somebody should honor his servants? 
Isn't that an honor of the king? If the king has a minister, he has a group of ministers, and the ministers come and visit you, is it not an honor to the king when you honor the ministers? So they said, well, God has all these ministers. He has the sun and the moon and the stars and all the angelic beings. Wouldn't it make sense for us to do a sun dance, a moon dance? It's an honor for the king because all of the constellations, they get their orders from Hashem. And therefore, wouldn't it make sense for us to honor them as well? I'll tell you the root. It is a true point. You're thinking like that. He's making a good point. The problem is, imagine the king is in the room. If the king is in the room and you honor the minister in front of the king as opposed to the king, is that an honor to the king? No. There's no bigger slight to the king. And what they fail to realize is the power of God's complete ein oid melvadai, complete presence in every single part of creation at all times. They felt there was some type of a distance in that and therefore there was like places that the ministers could be but not Hashem. And therefore it would make sense to honor the ministers when not in the presence of the king. And the world continued to spiral out of control in this manner. So much so that the world continued like this and then they started to build sanctuaries, temples for these constellations, for these stars, for these idols. And they started to bow down to them. And they said, this is what the king would want, me to honor the minister of the king. And then something else happened. Something very, very scary. They started to say that, oh, they knew God, but they said, oh, God must want me to do this. After that came false prophets. False prophets then came into the world and they said, not only do we have to you know, honor these as a way to honor the king. The false prophet said, I spoke to these constellations. I spoke to these animal spirits. I spoke to these deities. They told me to worship them like this. And make sure to send a big check in the mail to me also, because I'm giving you guys the goods. I'm telling you what and how to worship. These are the false prophets. They did not have any communication or true communication. There is such a thing as having communication with idols, but that is totally forbidden. There is such a thing. It's called black magic. So these false prophets started to get up and they filled the world and they told people to worship like this and worship like this. And then they started to go even further. They said, and this is what it all, what they really look like. And this is the way they want to be worshipped. So they started building all of these idols everywhere on all the mountaintops and all the valleys. All these strange idols everywhere. The world was getting into it. Ad Kedekach, the children of that generation, never knew God. Because they grew up with this lowercase God, this one and this one. And all of a sudden, it spread over the entire world. Okay, this is how the world spun out of control. And it got so bad that ten generations after Adam, there was a man named Noah, who was a tzaddik. He was a tzaddik. And God said to him, build an ark. Anybody know how many years? 120. 120 years. Hoping that he would help to do some kiriv. Not one person did shuva. The world was spinning out of control. Immorality. Theft. The theft that they were doing at that time was also, like the things that are happening now in California, as long as you don't steal $1,000, it's not a felony anymore. You know what I'm saying? So people are raiding the shops. Yeah, less than a pruta, right? Like yeah, so they, oh, very good. So the, they would steal less than a pruta because you can't, in the times of Noah, if you, if you steal less than a pruta, like a penny, and nowadays probably a nickel, whatever, the smallest amount of money, it's probably going to be a dollar, if not ten dollars very soon. And then it, it goes quick after that. That small amount of money... So they can't be taken to trial for it. So everybody's stealing less than a pruta. If everybody goes into a Wawa uh, and steals less than $999 or Walgreens or whatever, the, they, they go out of business pretty quick, no? CVS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're moving all their stores out of there. You know what I'm saying? The, that, that, that's not allowed. You know, you can't do that. But in the times of Noach, the world was spinning out of control. Sounds like what's happening now. And Hashem said, Noah, you're the only righteous family in the world. The world had to get reset. 
Okay, they were also doing other things in sexual immorality, which we won't get into now. It's not, it's not for us to talk about now, but it was a very, very bad time. After Noah, the world is recreated. And then 10 generations, the world is spinning out of control. I want you to know, at any moment, anybody could have stood up and said, Hashem, you are the one. You're the only one. And there could have been many of these people Whoever would stand up and say, God, you are the one, would be called the Jew. And as the world was spinning out of control, right at the end, when the world had gone into what's called the, ta- the time of the Tower of Babylon, and the world was rebelling against God, fighting God, literally, a war against God, sounds like many places nowadays, fighting God, At that time, one great man stood up. And his name was Avram Avinu. Abraham, our father. He completely chooses God. He himself grows up amongst idols. His father was the greatest of the idol worshippers. He knew how to do all the black magic. And Avram Avinu grows up in that. But he starts questioning at a very young age. He has no teachers except his intellect. And he starts thinking, where did this world come from? Finite doesn't start by itself. It had to come from something bigger than the system. He starts tracing the world back to its origins. He was the first real philosopher. He's called Avram Ivri, Avram the Jew. But Ivri also means he's Me'ever Hayam. He's on the other side of the river. Meaning, he was standing on one side of the river, Humanity is standing on the other side, completely filled with paganism. The first Jew is the one that rejects all paganism, even against all popular opinion. Right, you know that one, I support the latest thing? Whatever the narrative is? So Avram Avina would have just smashed that. Whatever the narrative is, he is questioning it. Avram Avina is here for truth. The purpose of the Jew is to find the truth. And Avram is running around, what is this world all about? He's looking, he sees a world on fire. Meaning there's movement, there's action, but who's running it all? And he's, 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 he's going crazy thinking about it. Until he has what's called a prophetic moment. Hits it, Salah Balabira. And Hashem appears to him and says, it's me. I'm behind all this, you found me. And that begins Lech Lecha the third portion of the Torah, where Hashem says, now, leave your father's home, leave your community, leave the place that you came from, leave everything, and go on this spiritual journey. That's our great, 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 great grandfather. He has a son, his name is Yitzchak. He had another son, called Yishmael. Yishmael was off the path, got into bad things, even though at the end of his life, Yishmael does tshuva. But the blessings go to Yitzchak, to Isaac. The Akeda is with Yitzchak right here in Haramaria. Yitzchak has two sons, Esav and Yaakov Avinu. Esav is a Russia. But Esav pretends like he's a big tzaddik. Esav, you know, Esav came out, he was all asui. He came out, he was fully hairy. He had like a deep, dark, like a, a deep voice from the second he came out. Can you imagine? And talking. With teeth, he comes out like, hey, ma, you know, you know, like hairy. The man was hairy with a beard. He had one of these like big red rebisha beards. He wore a bekisha and a strimal, but he was a fake. He was a phony. He made himself look like a tzaddik. He would go to his father and say, hey, how do you take tithes on, on wheat? How do you take tithes on salt? He made him, you don't need to take tithes on those things. He made himself look like he was a big tzaddik. He was completely rotten on the inside. It was all a game, it was all the outer game. But he made himself look like something. He's what's called the fake holy people of the world. And what was he doing when nobody was looking? The worst things. He was a murderer, he was a rapist, the horrible idol worshiper, 
Sad. Very, very sad. Why did Yitzchak like him? Because if he would have done tshuva, he could have built the whole world. He could have built Hashem a kingdom. Esau was called Tzayd B'piv. He was a man, his mouth would trick you, but he had Yadami De Esau. His hands could build things. We have this campaign that we're making shuls beautiful again. Mashka, make shuls beautiful again. He would have built beautiful shuls. Just look at the New York skyline. It's like Esau's building. He's a powerful builder. So Yitzchak said, if we could just harness that, but Rivka knew he's not going to do it. There's something very, very not good here. The blessings go through Yaakov. Because you know what truth is? Truth is, what does God want? Yaakov is Ish Tam, Yeshev Oyhalam. Yaakov is the perfected one who cleaves to Hashem, who cleaves to Torah all the time. Jacob, Yaakov Avinu. And then Yaakov has 12 sons. And the Torah says they're all good. They're all good. Those 12 sons begin the family of the Jewish people. And then we go into Egypt. 70 people, a small family. Shivim Nefesh, 70 unified as one. In Egypt, we become the Am. That's when the slavery comes to epic levels, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. Epic levels of, of going through that crucible to refine out diamonds, and the Jewish people from that are born. We have to go through this for s things that Avram did wrong at his level, and the Jewish people are born out of that. We go through the plagues, we cross the sea, and we, come, we fight Amalek, we fight that evil nation Amalek, which we're still fighting, and we march 50 days until where? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. <coughs> Har Sinai. At Har Sinai, we receive the Torah, both the written Torah and the oral Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu goes up. The entire nation watches Moshe Rabbeinu go up, which means we not only have a national prophecy, the only national prophecy of any other nation in the world. Nobody has such a claim. We don't, we're not even a religion. We're a people. We're a family. No other claim of national revelation ever, which means every single person experiences the revelation. How do you falsify that when every single person says it? It's like me saying to you. You know, if I say to you that I had a dream last night, everyone knows uh, a king had ten sons, and the king passes away, and he doesn't say who the next king is going to be. So you know what happens? A week later, one of the sons gets up the next day, he tweets everybody, come to the town square, I have an announcement. He said, my father came to me in a dream. I am the next king. Do you believe him? Why don't you believe him? Do you have evidence that it's not? He was the only one then that, like, that witnessed it. So it's very weak evidence I, because, you know, you might say, I have evidence that it's not the king. I'll tell you why. Because if my father could come to you, so then he's going to make us have to believe you. If he can come to you, why didn't he just come to us and tell us that you're the king? So it's a proof that he's not the king. If, someone, if one person has such a revelation as, I am the savior, well, why didn't he come to all of us? It's a bit of a fishy story, no? So you know what would have been better? If everyone else got the prophecy. But what if the son wakes up the next day and he goes like this? You had a dream last night that I am the king. What are you going to do? Didn't have a dream. You're going to look to your, your mother, your cousin, your, your, your brother, and say, did you have that dream? <laughs> I, I didn't have it. Did you have it? Uh, no. Yeah, okay. You know, sorry, but none of us had this dream. It would kind of get clipped pretty quickly. At the technical term. <laughs> the Jewish people experience national prophecy, every single man, woman, and child. National prophecy. Every single person who's born to a Jewish mother is a Jew, no matter what. A person can become the Pope. If he forgets, Yal, Rabbi Shlomo would say, if he forgets Yalav Yovay and Rosh Chodesh, tonight's Rosh Chodesh, he has to repeat Yalav Yovay. Not tonight, but ever during the day. He might, he might say, I'm the Pope. What do you mean? Like, so what? You could be the Pope from Heim Morgan. If you forget Yalav Yovay and Shachros, you have to repeat uh, 
to repeat uh, Shema Nesra. Ayid is Ayid. That then creates the family of the Jewish people. A person is born to a Jewish mother, they're a Jew. So now that there want to be people, until this very day, an unbroken chain, back to Har Sinai. So now there's people that want to say and calm the question, no, this is not the Jewish people, we're the Jewish people. You have to very simply say, do you have an unbroken tradition? Your mother is a Jewess. You have an unbroken tradition back to Har Sinai. And this, that they want to make comments from the Talmud, or re even reject the Talmud, you can't be a Jew, you need to accept the Talmud. You know, a person could become Jewish if they want. We don't go out uh, forcing people to convert, but if somebody wants to convert, are they allowed to? Yeah. For sure. Is it easy to? Not necessarily. Not so much, why not? Because you want to see if there's real authentic desire. Not one of these like, not one of these like, so I'm like dating this like Jewish guy mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Probably I should convert, you know? His parents will make a big deal out of it if I don't. Yeah, his parents will make a big deal. So I, I, better, I better do it. Uh, that's not... Everyone, if they want to come, they can come. If somebody wants to come, they can come. That's very, very important. So our response to these uh, people in the world right now is, if you want to convert, so then you have to come. Come to the yeshiva. Come and learn. You really, you really want to be a Jew? So come, and you have to accept the oral tradition. Very, very important. Accept the oral tradition. Before a person converts, they have to go into the mikvah. They have to get a circumcision if they're a man, the mikvah. And then there's a question, which is, do you accept the written Torah? Accept the oral Torah? The person says, no, or I accept 612 parts of it, not all of it. I'm sorry. This is, this is real stuff here. So that's our response to those that are speaking nowadays of who the real Jew is. We should be Zoycha Mamish to have the ability to have real dialogue with, with humanity, talk to them. Because the mission of the Jew is just to give, just like Abraham did, give the message of peace to the whole world. Because Rat Hashem, you guys are in the place of just owning that you're a Jew, owning that. And we should be Zoycha Mamish to really be Jews and tell the whole world that Hashem loves humanity and just wants to see blessings for the whole world. Amen. Amen. Call to my friends. Have a wonderful week.